Um, all right, uh, final webinar of 2023 before we head into the new year. Um, not, not a long one, um, and probably code free as well. Just uh, exploring some some theory, just some um, some myths, some perception. All right, so dispelling the common negative selenium web driver myths uh, that you will often hear right um <clears throat> looking at kind of where they come from uh, you know why do they exist in the first place you know is this you know is this an unfair accusation you know aimed purely at web driver or is this something that we see in other tools that we'll be talking about uh, this evening as well um, and i think where you know where these things are true um, in some in some cases they will be, um, but actually, what's the real impact on what you're trying to do uh, from an automation perspective? Is it a showstopper? Is it really that big a deal? Um, is it just something to be expected in terms of you know working with a particular framework? Um, so I think what's so often missing in some of these uh, things or things you'll read or things you'll see is actually a little bit of context. Um, all right. The likelihood is that you have some kind of automation challenge to solve or a strategy to implement, um, and you're uh, you're wanting to understand how much of an issue these really are, and you know whether they're going to impact you or not. You know, in the real world. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, yeah, without further ado, let's uh, let's move into it. Go, my personal favourite, um, probably the number one. All right. Uh, WebDriver struggles with dynamic content. Uh, you know, WebDriver is flaky. WebDriver can't deal with uh, single page web apps. Um, you're going to see this everywhere. Uh, probably the number one, as I say. Um, right, so the idea of flaky tests. Okay, what is a flaky test? Well, um, a flaky test is a, a test that is no longer doing its job, right? It's no longer telling you about the quality of the application. And the reason for that is because they're going to pass and they're going to fail intermittently, um, even without any underlying code changes to the application under test. Um, all right. Now, I saw a definition on the, on a particular page, uh, which I very much liked. Okay. And that's that they become non-deterministic. All right. They cease to add value, and as I say, they're not telling you about the application quality because they're passing and failing, you know, at will, uh, changing from one build to the next. Here's the thing, right? This is not something unique to Selenium, uh, of which I'm going <laughs> to show to you in just a second. Um, you know, you're going to hear this a lot: flaky tests, Selenium. Okay. Um, in in the intro to uh, to the webinar, or you know, as part of the um, the kind of the uh, the promotional content for this webinar, uh, we talked about the big three. Uh, all right, so I would have mentioned uh, Selenium, Playwright, and Cypress. Uh, I think as we go into twenty twenty four, they're undeniably the three to uh, that are kind of got market share. Uh, Puppeteer probably falling by the wayside uh, somewhat. Okay, so we'll focus on these three, but. I want to make it very, very clear that <laughs> test flakiness is something that exists in all of these. Uh, if we take that definition of flakiness, all right, um, and we'll see in just a second, right? Playwright, Cypress, WebDriver, they all have uh, significant uh, coverage. You know, video tutorials, written documentation, uh, user guides on how to manage this idea of flaky tests. All right, all three of them. Okay, it's common to all of them, um, and what we often see uh, is it's very common uh, for teams with uh, itchy feet to kind of bounce from one tool to the next, looking for this kind of utopian UI-based automation solution, where you know test flakiness miraculously doesn't exist. Well, it does. Um, all right, so the grass is not always greener on the other side. Okay, but with all of these, okay. There are ways of dealing with this, right? It's part and parcel of UI-based, uh, you know, test automation for a variety of reasons, um, and that's not the purpose of this uh, of this particular webinar to talk about flakiness in detail. But the idea that this is something that's just a Selenium thing is uh, is wrong. Um, okay, so yes, there are ways to build in uh, resiliency to your tests uh, with any of these, with Cypress, Playwright, and Selenium. Um, but let's also consider that of the three, it's still only WebDriver that remains, uh, you know, the officially supported, endorsed uh, browser driver from uh, the W3C standard. 
All right, so that says something. That's a big deal. So listen, I wanted to give you a few examples. So let's have a quick look through here. Um, so if I kind of jump across to the Cypress docs, um, in the key differences section, all right, so why is Cypress different? It's flake resistant, all right? Uh, I think in many ways it's kind of dangerous for any tool to claim to be entirely <laughs> free from test flakiness uh, you're, you're setting an impossibly high bar there in some respects um all right there's a very definite reason why cypress say this of course right because uh, you know you're not driving a browser in the same way that webdriver and playwright are fundamentally doing that all right um all right so cypress knows and understands everything that happens in your application synchronously right this is what it says this is why it purports to be flake resistant um, I'm sure you've read all of this you're probably very familiar with the claims um, all right but <laughs> this is on the key differences section on the same documentation website you will also find a section on flake detection flaky test management an entire section of the Cypress documentation um, <laughs> dedicated to uh, dealing with flaky Cypress tests who'd have thought it um, and there's a commonality here, right? What we're going to start to see is this concept of, yes, switch on the test retries. That's going to fix everything. Uh, I mean, that, that's, yeah, to be fair, that's, that's not what they're suggesting. But what they are suggesting is by enabling test retries, you can start to see, uh, you know, look for a pattern with these tests. You, is it passing once and kind of failing? Is it failing twice before it passes the third time? You know, so you need to have some degree of retry before you can start to maybe manage these flaky tests. But just the idea that on one hand, uh, a tool like Cypress purports to be flake free. And then there's this huge section um, that talks about how to manage your flaky Cypress tests. Uh, and lo and behold, there are certain features, flake detection, uh, that are only available to uh, premium subscribers i would suggest there you go so uh, test flake detection uh, is available to users with a uh, team cypress cloud uh, plan fair enough um but yeah it's uh, you know on one hand flake free on one on the other hand uh, quite quite clearly not so um and what you'll also see as well in the uh, the cypress dashboards and again this isn't a feature that uh, i don't think everyone pays for this particular feature um there is a very definite filtering mechanism and a you know, way of hiving off your flaky tests to analyze exactly why they're flaky in the first place. Uh, look at this, even have a, a flaky test analytics section, another paid feature. Um, so yeah, there we go. I think we can clearly see that the concept of flaky tests is something that is very much alive and kicking uh, in the Cypress world as well. Um, and just have a shop around, right? Just go Google it. Look at this, cypress.io, flakiness making me crazy. Um, and then let's pop over to YouTube, all right? So plenty of tutorials. Uh, I guess, firstly, about actually using this, this flaky test management feature within cypress.io uh, itself, um, but also kind of ways of analyzing how to avoid this uh, test flakiness. Um, you know from real real world users uh, okay so there you go definitely not unique to selenium that's that's two out of three so far uh, and if we keep going we're coming to the playwright side of things as well right so we're on the playwright docs now playwright.dev um here you go a whole section on retries right test retries are a way to automatically rerun a test when it fails this is useful when a test is flaky and fails intermittently so I think there you go. We are three for three. WebDriver, Cypress, and Playwright. Uh, you know, flakiness can be a part of all of those. Um, all right. So just having a flick through the uh, Playwright documentation here. Um, there you go. If you enable retries, a second worker process will start by retrying the failed test and continue from there. Playwright supports retries. And then Playwright test will categorize tests as follows, passed or failed or flaky. Uh, so in much the same way that probably Cypress does. Uh, and you know, uh, certain frameworks uh, that serve as wrappers to Selenium can offer you this kind of functionality as well. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that uh, all three of the big three on the market right now uh, suffer from flakiness to some extent or another. 
Um, but with all of them, right, you there are things, of course, you can do to build your tests um, as resiliently as possible. Um, but yeah, Selenium only, definitely not. Um, what else do we have here? Yeah, look, play right handling flaky tests, retry blocks of the code, retry full test. Talks a little bit about uh, reasons for flakiness here. Um, there you go, one of that uh, that definition that I quite enjoyed earlier, non-deterministic uh, behavior. They're not doing their job. Um, there you go, and then uh, let's have a look here. So yeah, plenty of video tutorials uh, on YouTube for Playwright flakiness as well. Um, all right, retrying assertions without failing tests. How to retry failed test cases in Playwright test retry. So the whole uh, the whole concept of, of retrying tests as well is is one that quite often splits the audience. Um, you know there are there are reasons for flaky tests, right? Whether it's a, a, a badly performing uh, test environment, you know that's one distinct possibility. Um, obviously, not understanding application state and having the uh, the browser driver trying to you know uh, the test is moving quicker than the application is is behaving. Um, badly written locator strategy. You know these are all reasons that that these these tests uh, can fail. Um, but yeah, two schools of thought and retries. You know, one it's uh, it, really what it is is a level of tolerance, isn't it? Right. So if you're saying this test has failed twice in a row, I want to give it one more chance to pass. Really, what you're you're doing is kind of delaying the inevitable there of of doing the analysis to actually understand why that test is failing, right? A flaky test uh, is not all of a sudden going to become a kind of a reliable test. Something needs to be done to make it more resilient or deal with the underlying cause for its flakiness in the first place. Um, so other people actually, you know, hate the concept of retrying. You know, it's masking an issue that is problematic in my testing, and therefore I want to know about that test failing. Um, or in this case, I you know I want to know it's a, a flaky test. I need to deal with that. But the idea of just retrying it over and over again, um, because really what that's going to do is going to potentially shorten your you know your 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 runtime or your analysis time if you allow it two or three attempts before you really give up on it and say right enough's enough. I need to understand now. Um, anyway, so I think you know retries and test flakiness kind of go hand in hand. Um, all right, so moving on. Uh, WebDriver is slow. Yeah, another another common uh, perception. Um, fair or not, you decide. Uh, but I think that the context here as well, right? What's important is okay. Slow compared to what? All right. What's your what's your point of reference for that? Um, and is that the only factor? Is that your overarching, uh, you know, factor for? choosing an automation framework right because if you make that the primary factor it's going to be uh, at the exclusion of other factors which could be equally important to, to you and your team when it comes to choosing a product right or a framework so at what cost um, so yeah speed is important as it says here uh, but the ease of script development test case maintenance test running stability uh, product feature set and so on need to be considered right absolutely so um so shout out here to the guys at uh, checklyhq.com so you'll find this on their blog so this is a very uh, impressive in-depth article that talks about um is a it's a speed comparison essentially between cypress uh, selenium playwright and they throw puppeteer uh, into the mix as well so i'll give you the short version first but um yeah what you'll see there is uh if you take Puppeteer out of the equation at the moment, because we're really just focusing on Playwright and Cypress uh, with Selenium as having market share. But in that case, um, yeah, Playwright is leading the charge with slightly reduced run times. There's three scenarios they talk about, which we'll look at in a second. Um, without Puppeteer, Selenium would come in in a very solid uh, kind of second place. And then Cypress brings up the rear in, in third place, uh, according to these guys and the, um, the deep dive investigation that they did. So... Um, what did they do? So they had a, um, a static website, effectively, for one test, um, then more of a kind of an end-to-end -end test uh, as a as a second timed exercise, and then more of a test suite for a third exercise. Uh, the kind of the blue, the red, and the amber that you'll see there. Um, let's just look at the basic timings, right? So let's take the full suite because that's probably you know we're never ever just going to gauge these things on one test. Um, but the full suite, so we're saying Playwright kind of clocked in at, I'm going to read that as about 32 seconds, something like that. 
Web drivers coming in at 37, 38 seconds, maybe. So, yeah, five or six seconds for you know the entire suite. So it's not insignificant. Um, you know, but it's not a it's no not a showstopper either. Uh, and then Cypress a fraction longer, touch under 40 seconds, maybe 39 seconds. Uh, so that was on the entire suite, right? So um, what I think we can take from this is actually the startup time for some of this as well. So if you look at the just the single the single test or static website, uh, you know, Playwright, what, three seconds? Fractionally faster than Selenium, three and a half, four seconds there maybe, definitely uh, less than five. Uh, and Cypress is a touch over 10 seconds there, you know, so, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, if you want to look at this article, uh, yeah, go and check out uh, checklyhq.com. Shout out to these guys for putting these uh, these figures together. Um, there you go, Cypress versus Selenium versus Playwright versus Puppeteer uh, speed comparison. Um, there you go, so let's just look at, you know, essentially what was done here. Um Right, there we go. First uh, benchmark test, a demo website built with Vue.js hosted on Heroku. Um, practically static, very little data actually fetched in the back end. Um, all right, so there's your kind of first set of metrics. Um, so maybe we just take the top row of the mean, play right, uh, just under 3.2. Uh, Selenium, uh, 3.66. Cypress, 10.35. Um, you know, kind of five to six seconds uh, slower. Um, I think it's that startup time. Uh, all right. Uh, just coming down, so a second flavor of test there. Um, I think this is, uh, here we go. Ah, there we go. Second scenario is a longer end to end test. Uh, logs into an app.checklyhq.com, creates an API check, uh, deletes the check. Um, so we've got some uh, metrics there. So the mean, so Playwright's doing that in a fraction over 13 seconds. Uh, Web drivers doing that in a uh, touch under 16 and a half seconds and Cypress at uh, a touch over 23 and a half seconds. So, yeah, you know, Playwright is is consistently up front in terms of shortest time. Um, no denying that. Certainly with regards to this site, this test and these metrics, uh, as you can see. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, the question to ask coming back to, you know, this. Web driver is slow? Well... Is it really? And as I say, and compared to what, you know, that can't be your only factor for consideration. I'm sure it's not. Um, but we'll see when we look at some of the other things, right? So, uh, you know, Cyprus will limit you with language choices, for example. It will limit you with uh, what it can and can't do with certain browser interactions, for example. Can't deal with iframes, can't deal with multi tabs, uh, etc. Can't deal with multi browsers. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, the, the purpose of this is not a one tool versus other uh, comparison feature set. The purpose of saying, right, these are things that are commonly said about WebDriver, but how true is that? But actually, let's add some context to this. All right, so, okay, it's a little bit shorter, slower than Playwright. It seems to be, again, to quantify that in this survey, right, a little bit faster than Cypress. So really, is that, you know, is that of a huge consideration? Obviously, as you build up to a 500, 1,000 tests, then that is that is going to come into play. Um, but then there are things you can do, right? If you want to maintain fast-running suites of tests, okay, look at the idea of a critical subset of tests, a smoke test. You know, run your whole pack overnight. Uh, you know, there are various things you can do. You know, engage in a reporting platform that gives you real-time reporting. So, you know, you get results as they come through, you don't have to sit there and wait for three hours. There are many things you can do so that, you know, specific, uh, you know, driver execution time is, is not a deal breaker, right? When there are differences between these tools, uh, of which there are. Um, all right, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, again, high up, high up on our list of uh, Selenium rumors. Myths, misconceptions, whatever you want to call them. Uh, selenium is hard to learn. Um, all right, let's consider that for a second. Uh, maybe what we mean is that any kind of coded test automation is, is hard to learn. Maybe that's what we're really saying. Um, let's just think about what we're actually doing, right? So with any kind of automated test, it's this the concept of the three A's, triple A, right? We are arranging, we're acting, we're asserting. You know, and that applies equally well to unit tests and integration tests as it does for kind of end-to-end -end UI tests. All right, uh, right. WebDriver does limited stuff. Okay, uh, its primary job is to drive the browser. 
All right, so what are we doing? We navigate, we wait for some kind of application state. Um, we may or may not want to capture some uh, application information or some UI information. Uh, and then the thing that makes it a test, some kind of assertion, now that can either be against you know, positive or negative criteria. Um, and as we say here, right, there are shorter and longer paths to ultimate success uh, with this, right? So Selenium, uh, Selenium is hard to learn. Um, so let's just park that for one second, right? So the uh, you know the other end of the scale from uh, a coded framework automation strategy can only be codeless, right? So uh, codeless testing. Um, very prevalent right now. Uh, many, many tools that help you to do that job in a very proficient manner, I'm sure. Um, but codeless testing as a concept is sold to the market by people that sell codeless testing tools. Of course, you know, you'd expect no less. Um, but of course, it never is, right? It's never truly codeless. All right. Of course, there is underlying code there. There has to be. Uh, the difference is you don't see it, right? You definitely don't have access to it. Um, so as we say there, this is when you start to look at the idea of, okay, well, I've spent, you know, I've got a team of five people. I've spent uh, six months uh, developing automated tests with a codeless solution. Um, okay, well, you're very unlikely to ever get that code back should you need it. Well, first, because you're working with a product that tells you there is no code, all right? So what could you expect to get from that, that tool uh, if and when for any reason you chose to break away from it and go with a different solution? So that's probably when the idea of vendor and product lock starts to come into play as well. Um, now, what you'll see as well, and I've seen this with uh, Catalon, uh, for example, um, and other tools, maybe uh, Mabel, for example, I think. I think that's a fair example. Um, you will have the option to add your own code snippets to deal with particularly problematic or you know, specific UI automation challenges that are present on your application. Um, so the fact that you can add snippets of code, usually JavaScript, is going to tell you that you're not really dealing with a codeless solution. So some of your, even with a codeless solution, some of your most intricate automation challenges through the UI may actually require the introduction of code. Uh, so you may find you have to embrace coding, most likely in JavaScript, uh, to do what you need to do from an automation point of view. So let's just consider the three again, right? So Cypress, um, you are only going to be able to write your tests uh, with JavaScript. Um, there's a certain uh, Cypress syntax that, that kind of works with that as well. Um, Playwright offers you a bit more, right? So JavaScript, Python, Java, uh, and C Sharp. Um, and Selenium offers the most. The officially supported uh, bindings are for JavaScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, and Ruby. So five officially supported. I think I've seen a uh, reference to Kotlin as well, maybe, as a sixth, and Perl, I think, as maybe a seventh. But the officially supported languages are those five. Um, now, speaking from experience, you know, we would say that uh, without a doubt, Ruby and Python, of all of those, are going to be easier to learn, quicker to pick up for, for a newbie, uh, for a beginner in the uh, automation arena, than certainly than JavaScript, and absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, simpler than, than C Sharp and Java. Um, now, sometimes uh, tools like Selenium IDE, for example, uh, most tools have some kind of trainer now, some kind of code generator, test recorder, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and obviously, if you're working with a codeless tool, it's going to allow you to record your interactions with the web application, um, but it's not going to give you any code at the end of that. Um, whereas if you're working with Selenium IDE, for example, uh, to use their code generator, their recorder, um, again, you're doing the same thing. You're stepping through the application, you're making assertions, but it's actually giving you the code uh, at the end of that process. So those can accelerate the process, of course. You know, that's that's what they're for. Um, so, you know, I've, I picked up on a couple of quotes here. So there was uh, the first one there from, uh, I want to say, Altex, altexsoft.com. Uh, uh, they're a tool provider um, and on their blog, um, which is entitled The Good and the Bad of Selenium Test Automation. Um, and, you know, to quote them, uh, many companies, especially startups, tend to employ their best coders to write product features and engage less skilled people in automated tests. 
Now that may be true, um, but what that also does is, is it feels like to me is, is to do a disservice to the desire to actually build a quality uh, application by treating, uh, you know, independent testing of that application as a bit of a second class citizen. Uh, that's certainly what it, it sounds like to me. Um, as opposed to on the other end of the fence, or sorry, the other side of the fence, uh, Gerald Weinberg. Um, if you don't know him, go look him up. A very clever guy, but yeah, he's he's authored more than forty books and you know hundreds and hundreds of articles on computer science. Uh, you know, lots in the testing and the quality assurance arena. Uh, and he says, and you know, not everyone's going to agree with him, but you know, testing is harder than developing. If you want to have testing, good testing, sorry, you need to put your best people uh, in testing. Um, so quite the opposite, you know. <laughs> Give testing the attention, the effort, the people, the resources, the skill set that it requires to do it well. Um, and probably your total cost of ownership or development of your software is, is probably going to drop and your release cycles will also reduce. And your quality will go up, your happy customers will go up, your revenue will go up, etc. etc. Um, so Selenium is harder to learn. Well, let's just come back to Cypress versus Playwright. Cypress, if you're a complete beginner... Um, in my humble opinion, in our humble opinion, um, picking up uh, Selenium, uh, native Selenium, you know, without any wrappers or anything like that, but using Ruby or Python, would be an easier introduction than trying to pick up uh, Cypress with JavaScript, or Playwright with JavaScript for that matter. Uh, but then Playwright offers Python, so maybe Playwright sits in the middle of this kind of conversation. So is Selenium uh, harder than either of those? I would say no, it's probably easier if you go with that type of language, Ruby or Python in this case, um, to begin your automation journey, your coded framework automation journey. Uh, as a beginner or you know, a manual tester kind of transitioning into to doing some automation. Um, but the fact is, you know, we're talking about coded automation frameworks. So coming back to the very beginning of this, uh, this page, you know, you're a, you're at one end of two ends of a spectrum. You're either the the coded framework side, and and that's what you're about to embrace, and that's the journey you're going to go on, or you're on the codeless side. Um, so yes, coded frameworks, writing code, if you've not done it before, is going to have a learning curve to it. Is Selenium any steeper than the others? I would say absolutely not. And it's going to depend largely on the the kind of the language choices uh, you make. But to that point, right? There's never been a better time or a kind of more accessible level of information available to you as a new starter to actually get going with this right there's articles like this right Jim and Jan um, Selenium web drivers are the easiest to learn web automation framework um, uh, yeah very knowledgeable guy I like this guy a lot um, does a lot of work with Ruby and native Selenium I think um, uh, I think he's quite a fan of, uh, of Playwright as well potentially but just shopping around, let's just, you know, let's run the same Google search for each language variant, right? So, so le uh, learning Selenium with Ruby, four and a half million results, no shortage of uh, tutorials, you know, links to YouTube, uh, Q&A, you know, major vendors getting involved here, browser stack, right? Getting, getting started with automation using Selenium and Ruby, Lambda test, one of browser stack's uh, competitors, Apply tools in the visual testing arena. Learning uh, Selenium WebDriver with Ruby from their Test Automation University. We're another great, uh, great resource, actually. I think Angie Jones uh, is part of that. Uh, articles on Medium, uh, Tutorials Point, you know, uh, TestProject.io, another, uh, I think that's the open source project from Testim, I want to say, um, on their site, talking about how to use uh, Selenium with Ruby. Uh, Udemy, another kind of course academy type uh, platform, right? So that's just the Ruby side. If we uh, move on, same thing, learning Selenium with Python, exactly the same thing. Coursera, browser stack, uh, plenty of tutorials, Lambda test, right? So pretty much a, an, <laughs> an equivalent language representation on each of these sites um, to get you started, right? So there's never been a better time to get started. Here's the JavaScript version, 22 and a half million. Actually, what was Python? Python was 28 million. Uh, JavaScript, 22 and a half million search results, give or take. But yeah, the same thing, right? There's never been a better time. There's a wealth of information available to you. Um, 
so yeah i mean and then just looking on kind of youtube here we go obviously entire course is dedicated you know from from start to finish to to give you the basic skills necessary to to join a team and actually you know, make a contribution in the automation space so this is learning selenium with python a bunch of stuff there of course there is uh, and then the same thing with JavaScript, right? So, uh, is it is it harder than learning anything else? You no, know, I think you know it's what you make of it, right? The opportunities are there, um, and there's just plenty and plenty of material for you to pick up and get moving. Um, so, Selenium is hard to learn, as hard as any other automation framework, I would say, dependent on uh, on language choice. All right, okay, moving on. Uh, right. Another firm favorite, Selenium uh, is, is terrible at reporting or doesn't have reporting uh, to be more accurate in the uh, in the accusation. I'll call it an accusation because it's, it's not a myth. You know, Selenium doesn't have reporting. Right. And there's a reason for that. And we're not comparing apples with apples here. Right. So Selenium WebDriver, as it says, drives the browser. That is it. Selenium WebDriver drives the browser. WebDriver on its own is not an automation framework all right it's not a complete automation solution uh, now that in itself may be a turn off for you know a faction of people who knows but um, its job is to drive the browser it doesn't care about the concept of your test what your test is how it's meant to run um, or you know how it's meant to determine some kind of result and, and output that uh, at the time of execution um, all right so a complete solution requires you to have some kind of test runner or engine and some kind of assertion library as well all right and effectively web driver sits there in the middle drives the browser uh, with one of your language bindings ruby python javascript uh, c sharp java whatever it is uh, and it's going to interact with the browser the same way a human does. Uh, um, all right, but unless you have a test engine, a test runner, and a, uh, and a reporting library, uh, no, sorry, an assertion library around that, you don't yet have a complete solution. Um, all right. So yes, you know, Selenium doesn't have reporting, but because that's not it's it's not a holistic testing framework. So you know people need to be clear on that from from the start. It's not the same as comparing it to, to Cypress or um, yeah, or Mabel.com or Catalon or Test Complete in that regard. Uh, it's a driver. That's his job. That's what it has to do. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, you know, one of the big plus points about Selenium is the you know vast array of third party plugins that you can acquire and integrate with your your Selenium based automation framework, if that's what you're looking for. So if we talk specifically about reporting, all right, the things you're, or the versions you'll see, uh, the most popular probably on the market, test NG, you're always gonna see reference uh, to this, all right? Maybe not the most beautiful thing, uh, but functional, it's gonna do a job and it's gonna tell you <laughs> about your tests. Uh, maybe something similar, I've not used this personally, but uh, report NG, uh, HTML reporting, uh, actually, it looks like test ng is probably the uh, the engine or the runner, so to speak, and report ng uh, sits there as a listener and kind of reports upon the success of those tests. Um, all right. Now, I'm not going to dive into each of these, but I'm just making you aware there are there's a plethora of options out there for you. Right, extent reports. Now, I've heard a little bit more about this. Um, certainly, the UI is maybe a little nicer there, uh, but there you go. There's extentreports.com. Uh, which you could go and visit and learn how to integrate that with a selenium based automation framework and allure reports uh, i think probably the most user friendly of all um, looks kind of nice probably got all your core information there uh, and again a link there to, to go and understand what it's all about and how you can integrate into that in, into your framework right so there are plenty of reporting options out there there are plenty of um, uh, runners engines and reporting options to bring that together, integrate it with a Selenium WebDriver to give you this holistic uh, solution. Um, all right, and uh, of course, you know, we've seen no end of YouTube tutorials and, and guides on, on, on how to do this stuff. Uh, there'll be plenty of guides, the documentation for all of these is no doubt very, very good. So you just have to integrate one of these reporting tools um, 
with with the automation framework if you're using Selenium that you're that you're building. All right. So again, here, right, this is on browser stack. Test and G J Unit, um, uh, Calliope Pro. That's another one I've I've certainly heard about. Uh, I believe that functions more with the kind of uh, the manual uploading um, of test results, maybe CSV files um, for kind of a dashboard display over time to give you some test trends. Um, but there you go, there's no shortage of options. Um, JUnit HTML reports, another very popular one. Um, there you go, open sourced, simple, executes in minimal time, require minimal coding to integrate. Uh, that's only going to work with Java and JUnit in this case, but uh, there you go. Anyway, maybe uh, I would, if it were me, I'd probably look at extent reports or maybe Allure reporting uh, to, to start with there. Uh, let's just have a final look at what Lambda test tell us. Uh, right, nine of the best reporting tools for Selenium. Um, there you go, test ng <laughs> seems to be a number one report ng. So the runner and the uh, the reporting module, Allure in number three there. Um, so that's that's certainly cropping up a number of times. Uh, let's just look at Allure there in a bit more detail. So detailed test reports giving a clear visualization of summary defects uh, behaviors. So uh, BDD support there, interesting. Graphs and timelines, so probably some kind of trend information um, to see how things are moving. Uh, adapters for popular testing frameworks, uh, well supported with a GitHub community and Stack Overflow. Can set it up as on-prem if that's what you want to do. Uh, perfectly integratable, if that's a word, um, with Jenkins, GitLab, CI, uh, etc. Um, support for screenshots, yep, that could be very cool for debugging your tests, detailed documentation. So there you go. Um, so yes, uh, Selenium doesn't have reports, but that's not its job. So it's not really fair to compare it uh, in, in that manner. Okay, moving on. Um, ah, this is an interesting one. No uh, technical support. <laughs> Really, uh, I would uh, I would strongly debunk that myth if you like. Um, so let's start by defining technical support. So uh, can I immediately pick up the phone and, and speak to a Selenium product rep? No, probably not. Um, is that what I'm trying to do though? No, probably not either. You know what we have with Selenium. Okay, the reality is that it's uh, it's a kind of a volunteer based open source framework, right? It does have large corporate sponsorship, which can help, um, but immediately available to you, right? Numerous user groups, numerous chat rooms. Um, you can raise bugs uh, on their bug tracker for Selenium. Um, there are commercial support models available. Um, I can't tell you anything about those. I've never used them. I don't know what the fees uh, that would be involved in that look like or you know, what the support model looks like. But there is apparently a flavor of that, okay? Um, but then, you know, digging deeper into the kind of best practices and the coding side, yeah, there's certification, there's training. Um, obviously, you know, look on YouTube. There's over 20,000 YouTube tutorials on specifically on Selenium WebDriver. Uh, there are academies, there are learning-based, um, uh, kind of remote-based learning platforms. We talked about Coursera, Udemy, et cetera, course-based learning. Um, and just in terms of people that are, you know, still embracing Selenium and, and starting this journey for themselves. So um, I went to NPM Trends, okay, easy to go to. Um, just picked up a week, not that long ago, November 26th. 1.9 million downloads of the Selenium WebDriver node package. Okay, so that's how many people, you know, approximately on a weekly basis that are, uh, you know, dabbling in this Selenium WebDriver journey. Um, and this, you know, these support models, these these avenues that are available to you exist for those people that are, that are starting that journey. So no, I think, <laughs> I would say that is the very definition of technical support, you know, all of these things. Um, all right, so here's the uh, the selenium.dev page itself. So um, there's a Selenium, uh, I want to say, I guess it's an annual conference. Um, all right, so this is uh, there's plenty of output from there, so you can watch the videos. So actually, if we jump across to YouTube, this is the kind of output you're going to see from the, uh, the annual Selenium conference. All right, it's more the official stuff. Um, and of course, a vast array of stuff on YouTube for any aspect of, of WebDriver itself. So um, to me, that's going to be 
all the technical support I need. Um, so no, I would <laughs> strongly refute that myth. <laughs> Let's talk test execution at scale. So uh, a common um, misconception, I suppose, is, is that Selenium doesn't scale. Um, and unbelievably, you'll also hear that it can't be integrated within a um, continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, type of pipeline. Um, right, so Selenium will scale with something called Selenium Grid. Um, okay, so Selenium Grid is the uh, the part of the product or the part of the tool, if you like, the solution or the family of products that you'll want to implement if you want to test uh, at scale. Um, still open source. Okay, so um, what it's going to offer you is parallel execution uh, using multiple machines uh, in order to do that. Um, it employs a kind of hub and node architecture, similar similar to the way that um, uh, JMeter um, also works with kind of a master controller and a number of uh, a number of nodes to distribute the load. So Selenium Grid works in in a similar way. Um, all right, so the hub orchestrates that effort and uh, controls it across the multiple nodes. Um, so in terms of scale, right, so nodes can be added dynamically as required, right? So that is the very definition of, of what scaling uh, is all about. So that's going to enable you to run larger suites of tests uh, in a more efficient manner, right? It's perfect for cross-browsing testing. Um, and now with some of the latest releases of Selenium, Selenium Grid, um, uh, you have, or you can run this in conjunction with uh, with Docker. Um, so it really gives you a very scalable, uh, easily deployable kind of ecosystem within which to um, execute your automated UI testing at scale. Um, all right, so if you then want to bring that into a CI CD pipeline, something like uh, Jenkins or GitLab, it's absolutely perfect. Uh, you know to enable you to do that so uh, a myth it doesn't scale absolutely um, and you know it can absolutely be integrated into a um, continuous testing uh, continuous deployment type of pipeline no problem at all uh, again you've only got to have a bit of a rummage around in uh, YouTube just to see what's out there but yeah selenium grid tutorials what is it how does it work why you should use it um, plenty of uh, you know, language variations there as well. So, yep, that's how you scale with Selenium. Okay. Um, kind of looking past the, the setup and the execution side of things now, actually getting into the realms of uh, test case development, um, keeping things maintainable. Um, all right. So, something that's uh, an accusation that is commonly leveled at Selenium is that uh, it's slow to get off the ground. Uh, and, and running get up and running so uh, slow test and script development uh, and then down the line leading to kind of ongoing and high excessively high test maintenance um, with low readability so these are you know if you shop around these are things that you're going to see uh, in various places that are said about selenium um, and so the point i'd make here uh, and again i think this is you know, similar to the the concept of it being harder you know hard to learn uh, but in comparison with other coded frameworks like cypress and playwright um you know the same things uh, apply here 100 percent. okay so these kind of things are absolutely within your grasp entirely within your control um all right so let we focus on the first one right slow to get going slow test or script development well that you know that really it kind of hinges on a, on a few things right so firstly the you know the skill set of the person that's doing this right and coupled with the language that they've chosen to do it in um you know so i can you know i'm, I'm much more fluent with ruby than i am with with javascript so i can work with both perfectly well but it will take me a lot longer in javascript than it will in ruby uh, and i suspect um, that would apply to python as well so there are certain languages uh, which unless you're already an expert in that language um, so you know a front-end developer you know should they be brought into the test automation effort you know of course they're going to be very quick to just uh, crack on with with javascript right but um you know if you're building a team and bringing some new automation engineers on board some manual testers on this automation journey 
then you know making a sensible language selection like Ruby or Python is going to enable them to you know not take longer than necessarily to uh, to, to get going right so that's got to be a consideration um, and that's going to play directly into the readability as well so there's two examples here right there's a uh, kind of a native selenium with Ruby um, example uh, towards the top of the page and then bottom right is a kind of a Cypress-esque uh, you know, JavaScript example effectively doing the same thing just adding a couple of numbers um, right so we talk about readability now you know, if you can put your Ruby or, or JavaScript kind of prejudices to one side, you know, should you have one um, or, or your favorites to one side? Uh, I think it's fair to say most people would agree that the, the Ruby with the native uh, Selenium commands there are probably slightly easier to read, right? Readability, in terms of readability, what it's trying to do there. All right, so what the first time I've seen this, right? So, yeah, without looking at details. So we're adding a couple of numbers. So, uh, we're loading a page effectively, uh, index.html. Um, we're declaring A, we're declaring B. A is, uh, okay, so we're instructing the browser to find an element that has a name attribute of A. Um, and from that, we are looking uh, at its value attribute converted to integer, and we're declaring that as A, and then we're doing a similar thing for B. And then we declare result and we say driver so we can compare an expected with an actual result so we uh, get our actual result looking at driver so again instructing the browser find an element using uh, an id attribute of result take the text of that element convert it to integer and we expect a and b added together to equal the text that was scraped and converted to integer all right that's effectively what we're doing so Get two numbers, add them together, and compare them to uh, compare an expected and an actual result. Well, we're doing the same thing with Cypress and, uh, and JavaScript there. Um, now, to someone who knows JavaScript, yeah, that's that's going to be clear as day, no problem at all. Um, but to the uninitiated, uh, you know, one certainly would appear more readable than the other uh, at face value. And you do have to take it as face value, but I think you know it's unquestionably slightly more complex. I would say. Um, so that's the kind of readability side. Looking at test maintenance, well, I think you know this comes down to um, uh, you know developing the tests and the framework and everything that comes with it, um, with the best practices in place from the beginning. So uh, you know we've talked previously on webinars about things like the page object model, you know, why we use it, and the benefits that it brings. So we're testing a you know web application. Um, within our automation code let's have a representative page class in our automation code for each equivalent page within our web application you know like the cart like the home page uh, like the uh, overarching top level menu uh, like the footer at the bottom of the page for example each one of those could have a representative page class um, and within that page class in our automation code we'll set the methods that are unique to those pages on the application. So if I'm in the cart, then I've got something that you know allows me to adjust the quantity of a particular product in my cart, for example. You know, I have a, a method that will refer to uh, an element that only exists on that page and you know, it drives my test to kind of execute that user-based process. Um, so if you start building your automation code using something like the page object model, um, you know that is really all about keeping your code low maintenance that's the you know the very reason it exists so with any again with any of these frameworks right playwright cypress uh, web driver you know when something changes on the front end when that drop down list or that radio button uh, or that you know that checkbox when the locator strategy that you've used to hook into it whether it's an id or a a name a value a class you know whatever it is a, a data test tag you know if and when that changes uh, you know the page object model gives you a single place to go and make that update um, and that's you know that's the very definition of what low code maintenance is, is going to be about um, so as long as you build these things in from the start then uh, again this is why I say it's entirely within your control and regardless of framework this is just good practice kind of test automation coding right don't repeat yourself uh, keep your code dry the dry principle um, all right so that's you know really regardless of whether it's webdriver 
Cypress Puppeteer Playwright, you know, that's going to apply for all of these. And in fact, if you go away, go and Google page object model with Cypress uh, or with uh, with Playwright and you'll, you know, you'll find many, many examples showing people actually implementing that. Because, of course, the page object model came from the Selenium WebDriver uh, kind of community and some of the key authors uh, that were instrumental in its in its creation um, from the very beginning. All right, so yeah, it, it is a myth really in the sense that it's not, this isn't a Selenium thing, you know, it's it's a good practice coding thing. Uh, okay. Um, all right, another common one. Um, so although it's open source, um, it can take a long time and it can be complicated and there can be high initial costs to setting up a brand new Selenium based uh, framework. Um, well, the, you know, there's a common recipe to doing this, to getting it set up. So there are definitely things that you need to do, uh, right? So it's going to involve an IDE and any associated development kits, like a, a JDK, Java development kit, if you're using Java. Um, you'll need the Selenium WebDriver bindings, the library for your language we talked about. So whether that's C Sharp, Ruby, Python, JavaScript, Java, etc. Um, and then you'll need some build tools like Maven or Gradle for your dependency management and your kind of project building. Um, and then you'll need the kind of the real low level boilerplate code that will be required in order to actually kind of uh, open the browser, and, you know, initiate the browser before the tests and then to close it after the tests. Um, and then some of the things we've already talked about earlier, right? So then just coupled with some um, kind of a run engine and reporting plugins. So we mentioned test ng, report ng is the, the runner and the reporter, extent reports, allure reporting, different examples, but the same thing. So you're going to need to integrate those. Um, and then ultimately you'll, uh, you'll use a VCS to check that code into an automation repo. Um, and that's your setup. Now that side of things can be done in as little as 30 minutes. Um, you know, let's say anywhere between 30 minutes and a couple of hours, let's say, you know, maybe that's your initial investment to, to start from scratch, to have something ready to check in before the rest of your team could then pull down that code and start writing the tests. Um, so is that a staggering amount of time, you know, on a brand new project? Not really, not at all. Um, there'll be a, you know, there'll be a, a process that you need to follow. There'll be steps that you need to go through in the correct order to, to, to build the thing in the right way. Um, but no, well, you know, a long setup time? No, not at all. Uh, high initial costs? Only if you go about doing this the wrong way, right? If you start building these tests in the wrong way, uh, you don't use a model like the page object model that's going to help keep your code resilient, then yeah, maybe there'd be some rework required. But again, this isn't WebDriver specific, right? This is not a Selenium thing. This is just an extension of that good practice um, automation coding. Um, all right, so yeah, I'd, I'd say that's probably unjustified. Um, uh, and again, you know, plenty of tutorials, right? Look, building uh, building a framework from scratch in 30 minutes. Uh, there's one there incorporating Cucumber uh, with Selenium test ng. You know, that's that's the engine. Um, so plenty of examples um, of uh, you know why it doesn't need to take a long time and why it doesn't need to be too costly. All right. <clears throat> Uh, and then just finally, um, touching on mobile app support. All right, so this is uh, it's partially true in a way, right? So widely held belief that uh, Selenium WebDriver doesn't support mobile apps. Well, yes, in itself, that is that is true. Um, but not as uh, not as Cypress, not as Playwright. I would I would hasten to add. Uh, but WebDriver will allow you to. Um, or sorry, I should say, really, we, if you integrate Appium. Uh, with your framework, uh, then you will have that capability to test mobile apps, uh, both Android and iOS. Um, all right, so let's just kind of touch on what Appium is, right? So yes, Appium is built on the WebDriver uh, protocol. So it's fully compatible with Selenium. Um, and that allows you to, within your framework to be able to, you know, interchange between um, web apps and, and mobile app testing. All right, so it's a real good logical pairing of these two things together um, so it's going to allow you to run on multiple platforms it's going to allow you to test both iOS and Android uh, devices which you know, I would assume for the majority of people testing mobile apps you're going to want to do both um, support for both native and hybrid apps um, okay 
Um, so hybrid applications combining web views with native components. Um, okay, so it's going to have full support for all of that. Uh, in much the same way as um, Selenium has multiple language bindings, Appium uh, also provides that support for Java, for Python, Ruby, C Sharp, etc. Uh, one of the key things why many, many people opt for Appium over other mobile testing frameworks is that um, it allows you to drive the mobile app without actually modifying the app's source code to allow something to drive it. All right, and that's a key thing. You are not fundamentally altering the build of your application in order to be able to automate the testing of it. Now, some tools will require you to do that. So that's a key consideration. Uh, Appium is going to give you emulator, simulator, and real device testing. Um, okay, so uh, you can spin up something like Android Studio, um, get yourself a Google Pixel 5 image, for example, uh, and use that as an emulator. Or equally, uh, you can pick up your Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra, tether it via USB to your laptop, and actually target the physical device and run the test against that mobile app on a physical device. Um, I think, you know, serious, you know, real mobile app testing is going to require you to, you know, it's going to be a requirement of your automation framework. You're going to want to test on a real device at some point. Uh, and of course, then, you know, if you do uh, integrate to uh, external vendors like uh, Browser Stack or Source Labs or Cobaterm or Perfecto, because uh, you want to use a service like that to get access to a wider variety of uh, devices, um, then uh, yeah, because of its real device testing capabilities, Appium is going to allow you to do that. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about uh, CI/CD. So yeah, Appium perfectly, perfectly suited for integration within a CI/CD pipeline. Um, now, something I've not used myself, but Appium Desktop. So, uh, according to the Appium site, this is going to give you a, a UI, um, which you can then use actually to inspect your application, to um, to kind of retrieve your your locators for test case development with your for your mobile app automation. Um, so that's also something to think about. Um, and just like WebDriver, massive, massive uh, community support. Um, so yeah, okay. Selenium WebDriver doesn't directly support mobile app testing, but with a um, with a very logical pairing of uh, Selenium WebDriver and Appium together in your automation framework, you're going to have both of those skill sets. Um, so again, you haven't got to look too far uh, to find your kind of introductory guides as to how to get this uh, this up and running. Um, so it's all there for the taking, really. Okay, I just thought we'd wrap up, and we will wrap up now. As I said, I said we wouldn't. Uh, this would be <laughs> too long of a webinar, but um, you know, let's just kind of recap on you know some of the good things about Selenium, right? We just spent a lot of time talking about the perceived cons or the you know some of these uh, these myths, some of these negatives, if you like. Um, but the reason that you know, probably 1.9 million people downloaded uh, WebDriver in the week of November 26th. Um, massive language support, as we said. So Python, Ruby, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, officially. Other languages, unofficially, I think, maybe Perl, maybe Kotlin. Um, we talked about the huge community support, the tutorials, you know, the years and years of development and history that go into, uh, you know, the Selenium WebDriver family going back to, I want to say, 2004. I think it came from the uh, the ThoughtWorks crew uh, initially. Um, you know, there's even more of a frequent release cycle now than there ever was, especially now we're on Selenium Four. Um, it enjoys that level of corporate sponsorship from from some of the vendors like Source Labs and Browser Stack. Um, all right, so that allows the guys to invest in the continued development of, uh, of WebDriver, of which, of course, it will continue to be because, as we said, it's the only officially uh, W3C-supported endorsed driver, right? So it's not going to go away. Um, so you've got your Firefox, your Chrome, your Edge, your Safari supports. We talked about multiple operating systems, so you know Windows, Linux, uh, Mac OS. We talked about some of the plugins, so like the um, you know the reporting plugins like TestNG, Allure Reports, Extent Reports, um, 
sorry, report NG, test NG being the you know the runner or the engine. Um, and then should you need to scale, well, you now know that you can do that with something like uh, a Selenium grid. Okay, so yeah, all options available to you. Um, now it's actually got even easier, right? Because with the uh, latest uh, versions, I think up to, I want to say 4.13, maybe 4.14 of, uh, of Selenium, you now get something called Selenium Manager. Um, which is going to automatically manage the drivers that are required. So either Chrome driver for Chrome, uh, Gecko driver for Firefox, or Edge driver for Edge. Uh, I don't think it does it for Safari. Apple's a, a law unto itself. But for those three browsers, Selenium is now going to manage the drivers for you. Uh, it also gives you a really nice feature where if you need to, and we have other uh, webinars that touch on this, but if you need to download a particular version of Edge or Chrome, for example, or Firefox, you can just specify a version, you know, 116, 117. Um, a Selenium Manager within Selenium WebDriver will now go and get that browser for you and store it in your cache and then use that browser for your test uh, together with the associated driver to actually drive that version of the browser. Um, it also exposes you, you know, gives you access to the uh, the release channels, so the kind of the beta, the dev, uh, the nightly builds, the latest stable builds. So these all become things you can specify uh, that Selenium is going to manage on your behalf and just instantly make them available to you without any other kind of infrastructure or setup. So that's a, a nice new feature of Selenium. Um, we just talked about Appium, so that that gives you your mobile app testing. Um, yeah, and it's you know it's not resource hungry uh, when you're actually running this um, so again it might be a consideration right some of these other tools may just be a little bit too hungry uh, on your local machine um, so just again always worth considering but um, all right I'm gonna wrap it up there so um, there you go last webinar for 2023 uh, we must have covered 12 13 14 topics this year so uh, yeah it's been <laughs> very enjoyable covering this stuff uh, with you for you um if this you know if this is valuable to you if it's uh gives you something to think about something to go on your journey then please give us a, a thumbs up like and subscribe um uh, so we do offer uh, a 30-day valuation for our product test evolve uh, which will be no surprise to you that that is built on and around the use of selenium webdriver um, and we have our own uh, dynamic wrappers uh, in our spark api um that's certainly going to do uh, or go a long way to alleviating any perceived flakiness in your tests by doing a lot of that dynamic weighting and state checking on your behalf so that you don't need to do it now so that's the kind of thing we're investing in at the moment um, so yeah look hit us up kind of reach out via email or social media all the usual platforms linkedin youtube uh, facebook and <laughs> X, formerly Twitter. Um, yeah, please reach out. 30-day fully featured evaluation. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you for your time. Uh, have a fantastic holiday and end to your year. Uh, and we'll see you with a vengeance and renewed passion for testing and writing good quality code in 2024. See you then.